Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first event of the COI talk series. Um, I'm your host, Gina. And as you may already know, since you signed up for the event, we are kicking off with the first COI sustainability tech event with my great friends, as well as incredible student speakers from the Knowledge Society and a guest speaker tonight, Elise Su. Everyone has worked so hard to put this event together. So I appreciate the speakers here for making some time to come to this event to teach, connect, and inspire. So claps for them. Today is the first half of the event. So if you haven't already signed up for tomorrow's event, um, Friday in EST, you can sign up right now um, as I talk um, if, you haven't, if you haven't done so already. And we have three speakers tomorrow who will be talking about from cellular agriculture all the way to AI and cow poop. So before we start, listeners who are tuning in, feel free to ask questions in the chat throughout the talk. And at the end of each one, we will leave three to six minutes to answer those questions. And you also have the option to pick up the mic and you will be able to speak. You also have the option, as I already saw, um, to throw some claps, light bulbs, and other reactions on the bottom right throughout the talk to send energy, enthusiasm, and support for the speakers. So now introducing our first speaker, Nyla, 14-year-old from Ottawa, who's passionate about sustainable energy and nanotechnology. And Nyla will give us a great insight into what fusion energy is and advancements in the field, along with a special project she's been designing right now using graphene to boost the efficiency of plasma devices. So Nyla, take the mic. Amazing, thank you. Okay, I will screen. Can everyone see this okay? Amazing. Okay. The worst impacts of climate change could be irreversible by 2030. You've heard it all. The warming ocean, the shrinking ice sheets, the glacial retreat, the sea level rise, the acidity of oceans, the millions of deaths of people and wildlife all due to climate change. We have so many different energy sources and yet we aren't using them. Why is this? It's not like we don't want climate change to end. It's just that perhaps we don't have the resources yet to be able to accomplish this. Either they take up too much space or they're not accessible and can't be produced on demand or they have too high of cost. What if there were an energy source that didn't have any of these problems? In the 1930s, Hans Bett asked if we could take the mechanism that powers the sun and stars and replicate this in a lab. In the sun, hydrogen atoms fuse to create helium and energy. But obviously the conditions are very different there. How do we do this on earth? Well, fusion is like putting the sun in a bottle. We're just working on making a suitable bottle that has a perfect structure to contain this heat and energy. Well, that sounds hard. Why go to the difficulty? Fusion would be accessible, safe, and good for the environment because it's extracted from seawater and the crust of the earth. And so the only byproducts are small amounts of helium, which are not at all harmful. And we see this as a common problem with a lot of renewable energy sources, because although they by far outperform fossil fuels, they still release greenhouse gas emissions. And fusion does not. It would also be abundant and long lasting. It could last us for a million years. And although the cost right now is fairly high, once it becomes mass produced, it would become as cheap as fossil fuels. Okay, that sounds optimal, but let's check in with where we're at today. Right now, we are trying to address input versus output. We need high confinement for fusion energy. We need to achieve the Lawson criterion. And this compares the rate of energy being generated by fusion reactions to the rate of energy loss to the environment. This is difficult, but not a lost cause. These are the top five fusion companies right now. They're working toward a high fusion power gain and getting that power output to be more than the power input. And you'll see ITER is in the middle, and that's because it is the biggest fusion project in the world. It's pretty much a mega project, being internationally worked on by China, Europe, India, Japan, Korea, Russia, and the USA. ITER is working to produce 10 times return on the input energy, from 50 megawatts to 500 megawatts in a matter of 400 to 600 seconds. That's crazy. And their plan is to bring the machine to full power configuration by 2030. Let's go a little deeper. 
How does fusion actually work? Well, to understand fusion, we first have to understand fission. Because generally, when we think nuclear energy, we think fission. But fission and fusion are, in fact, two very different things. Oops. Okay, sorry. Fission is like a huge kettle that heats water to create electricity. It splits heavy uranium atoms to heat water into steam. And you may have heard nuclear energy is dangerous, but this is fission. These reactors, though simpler to run, are dangerous, release gamma emissions, can cause cancer, and can be used for nuclear bombs. I'm happy to say fusion is very safe and cannot be used for anything of these sorts, which is a big misconception I wanted to clear. We can think of fission like a little mountain and fusion like a big one. In fission, it's easier to lift a ball over the tip of the mountain, but when it rolls down, the return on your effort isn't very impressive. With fusion, it's harder to roll that ball up, and it takes longer. But when you achieve this, you can do anything. Now, going back to the analogy of the sun in a bottle, how is this miniature sun actually created? Fusion works with lighter elements, two hydrogen atoms, the lightest atoms on the periodic table, deuterium and tritium. These fuse to create helium, releasing energy and heat. Deuterium deuterium reactions are used a lot less often than deuterium tritium because they have a 20 times higher reactivity and a lower performing temperature. But the reason people wanted to look at deuterium deuterium in the first place is because deuterium is very abundant and tritium not so much. But there is a solution to this. Neutrons generated from the deuterium tritium fusion reaction are absorbed in a blanket containing lithium, which surrounds the core of a reactor. The lithium is then transformed into tritium which is used to fuel the reactor. And that is how we get more tritium. Now we know like charge repel. It's like taking two ends of a magnet, they just don't want to come together. And it's the same case here because we have two positive nuclei that we need to fuse. And this repulsive force is called the Coulomb force. So we overcome this Coulomb force by adding extreme pressure, speed, and heat, approximately 100 million degrees. And then we can get the attractive force, the strong nuclear force. Now, significant fusion rate rates require fuel to be confined at huge energies. When energy is added, deuterium and tritium turn into the plasma state, because when sufficient heat energy is added to matter, bound electrons are stripped from their nuclei. We can think of this as plasma soup of negatively charged electrons and positively charged nuclei. There's plasma in a lot of places, though, like televisions, fluorescent lights, and neon signs. These plasmas aren't fusing, though, and that is what we need to make fusion energy. Okay, well, how do we do this? How do we actually store this in our magical bottle to turn it into the sun and contain its heat? There are two main methods, inertial confinement and magnetic confinement. Inertial confinement squeezes and heats hydrogen plasma by using laser beams or ion beams. In an inertial confinement fusion reactor, there's a tiny pellet, usually of deuterium tritium fuel, that's compressed at a large density and temperature. Fusion power is generated in the very minimal amount of time there is before that pellet explodes. Magnetic confinement, on the other hand, heats and squeezes hydrogen plasma through magnetic and electric fields. A stream of hydrogen gas is heated by neutral particle beams, electricity, and microwaves, which changes the gas into plasma. The plasma proceeds to be compressed with magnets, and this generally occurs in a plasma device called a tokamak. And magnetic confinement is the most commonly used method of confinement, and that's what we see all the really big projects using right now. Okay, so this seems like the perfect energy source. Why aren't we using it? Like with everything, there are challenges. The main ones you may have heard of being complexity, resources, time, and startup cost. So right now it's $6 billion for a reactor, so not the cheapest expense. But we need to remember that the result will be extraordinary and well worth the money and effort. Think of computers. They took up a room when they started off and cost millions of dollars, and now we use them every day. And I want to talk to you a little bit about superconductors. And superconductivity is the property of materials to have no electrical resistance when cooled down to absolute temperatures. Superconductors are crucial to creating fusion, as they prove more effective in carrying current and producing more powerful magnetic fields. Eater's magnetic fields coils are the most powerful superconducting magnets out of any other fusion facility, storing 41 gigajoules of magnetic energy and weighing over 6,000 tons. They use approximately five kilometers of conductor for one coil wound. And the central core of the magnet requires 134 rotations of wire. 
However, superconducting coils in fusion devices do still require a fairly large amount of energy, money, and time, since magnet cooling can only work if cooling fluids are circulated through all of the coils. These materials will only superconduct when kept below a certain temperature, and that's called the transition temperature. This generally is somewhere below the temperature of liquid nitrogen, and that is called the Meissner effect. So as you can imagine, it would be a whole lot more efficient if it was possible for superconductors to function at room temperature, and that is called a high temperature superconductor. These would allow the employment of more powerful magnetic fields. A high temperature superconductor is defined as anything that has the ability to superconduct above a liquid nitrogen temperature. Right now, copper is used as the main coil winding material within tokamax, but copper cannot superconduct. It can come somewhat near to having zero resistance, but that's not perfect, and that's only when cooled to those really cold temperatures. Yes, copper is great due to its malleability, strength, ductility, connectivity, but still has too much res resistance. I recently attended an MIT talk by Pablo Rodriguez Fernando, recently named Forbes 30 Under 30. And when I asked him about the role of copper in tokamaks, he said that the future will hold HTS tapes for magnetic field coils, and soon copper will no longer be used, except in research plasma devices. High temperature superconductors display higher critical magnetic field, higher critical temperature, and high engineering critical current. The most common high temperature superconducting cable is made up of stacked yttrium barium copper oxide, or YBCO tapes and this would be used in the coil winding packs of magnetic field coils. And this is what leading companies like ITER are using, and which will likely be adopted for future tokamaks. Copper will still be used for testing, maybe, but for actual production of energy, high temperature superconductors will be used. And that's because obviously it's a lot easier to run without having to use liquid nitrogen temperatures, and it would be more efficient and could carry more current and produce larger magnetic fields. But it also opens up a lot of other doors, as fusion reactors would be able to be made compact. To get a little technical on you, the reason for this is because when magnetic field strength is increased, the ion gyro radius allows reduction of the size of a fusion device, therefore being cheaper and more economically viable. This is what Commonwealth Fusion Systems collaborating with the MIT Plasma Science and Fusion Center is working toward. They are focused on developing a machine called SPARC, which is a high field net fusion energy experiment that would be compact. This would be the first experiment to display net energy gain and would be done with the help of high temperature superconducting magnets. The high temperature superconducting magnets from Spark would be three times smaller in diameter, being a, only a few feet wide, while delivering 21 Teslas of magnetic field strength rather than ITER's 12. So think of what that could mean. However, these high temperature superconducting tapes are far from perfect. This area led me to what I'm specifically passionate about, achieving high temperature superconductivity in an effective way. And I'll walk you through my process. So my initial idea was taking graphene over a copper substrate so that chemical vapor deposition would occur. And then these could be winded into a wire and used as magnetic field coils in a tokamak. Uh, because basically when you take a graphene trilayer, it can superconduct. But what I soon realized is that graphene does not have the capacity to superconduct at the extreme temperatures required for fusion. And so this idea would be up against these HTS tapes, which can superconduct and can superconduct at high temperatures. So not the biggest competition. So then I decided to look at these HTS tapes on an atomic level. And I found superconducting current is sustained by flux pinning. These flux lines create pads for the magnetic flux. And flux motion has to be prevented through pinning those flux lines. There will then be higher performance and stronger magnetic fields generated. Right now, flux pinning in superconductors is somewhat random. And so I'm looking at improving flux pinning through the help of nanomaterials, like quantum dots, which are semiconducting nanocrystals. This could mean more effective plasma devices at cheaper prices. High temperature superconducting magnets efficiency is significantly lowered because of flux pinning, so if this could be managed in a better way, we would see substantial effects. Fusion has always been known for being 10 years off. It has a reputation of being futuristic and something that's just never going to happen. But this is no longer the case. Fusion is happening. Fusion is now. Although there are some obstacles we need to overcome, this isn't science fiction. It has incredible broad reaching implications and could give us the answer to the global climate crisis we find ourselves in today. And who knows, in 20 years, your electricity might just be powered by the magical energy source of fusion. Thank you. Woo!
Yes. Thank you so much, Nyla, for the amazing talk. Uh, remember, audience, this is your time to ask questions in the chat and leave reactions um, so that the speaker can directly interact with you. So we're going to open it up. Yes. Yes, you killed that. <laughs> we're just going to wait a little to see if anyone has questions. And if not, um, we will move to the next. Cool. Also, thank you guys so much for the enthusiasm in the chat. I love it. Ooh, so here we have a question. Where do you see Canada being a part of this innovation? Yeah, for sure. Well, there are actually, so CFS is actually like a Canadian company. There are some awesome Canadian companies um, and I think Canada will definitely be getting fusion energy. If you ask me, I think like, so Eater is planning to bring their machine to full power configuration by 2030. Um, I think that all of our houses will be powered by like 2050 by fusion energy. And I think Canada as well, for sure. But um, Canada will still play a role in the production of fusion energy because there are some pretty cool companies in Canada working on fusion right now. Cool. So the next question we have from Christina. What do you think is the biggest barrier to implement this innovation right now in Canada? Yeah, right now it's just like the complexity of fusion energy. I wouldn't even say like like cost. Like there is definitely a ton of funding in fusion because a ton of people believe that this is a great idea. So just the complexity of it all and getting it to actually work and function properly and like sorting out these high temperature superconducting tapes. But I think there's a great future for that. So we should be able to get past that. Cool, cool. Okay, so if that is it, if, if you guys have more questions, oh, we have, we'll answer one more, and the rest, um, Nyla, you could answer directly in the chat by replying yeah, sure. to them. Um, so yeah, in the first slide, you mentioned that by 2030, climate change effects will be irreversible, and ITER will have their reactor up to full power by 2030. So with fusion, do you see a possibility of achieving this reduction? Yeah, for sure. I think fusion just has such like substantial implications. Like it could honestly give us the solution to climate change. It could be absolutely incredible. Right now we're in kind of a tough spot in terms of the climate crisis, but I think fusion could give us an answer to that. Definitely, it has so much potential. So yeah, so we are gonna end it here for questions for um, Nyla, but if you do have any questions, feel free to type in the chat and she will directly answer. So let's go to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Amiel from Toronto, Canada, and she's a 15-year-old fashion enthusiast and environmental advocate, and she will be showing us technological solutions to fast fashion and how you can create fashionable change. So without further ado, welcome, Amiel. Yeah, thank you, Gina. Um, I'll just get started. Where do your clothes come from? Well, probably you got them from your closet this morning and you might've bought them online earlier or in a retail store. But I'm asking about before that. We rarely question the past and future of our clothes because we don't have to. We are constantly presented with trendy and inexpensive clothes, rarely taking the time to examine how and where they were made and what their actual impact is. This rapid mass production of cheap clothing, according to the latest trends, is known as fast fashion. And by the 1960s and 70s, clothing became a form of personal expression from young people embraced affordable clothes. However, in the 19 late 1990s and early 2000s, low-cost fashion became increasingly acceptable and desirable. So to make fashion trends available to consumers, retail companies had to quickly move clothing designs from the catwalk to stores. And today, fast fashion brands such as Zara, H&M, Gap, and Fashion Nova are built on speed and agility and churn out new clothing trends to fuel and meet our growing demand as customers. So fast fashion and its mass production have contributed to the democratization of fashion. It enables more people to purchase trendy clothes regardless of their socioeconomic background. So let's take a look at the life cycle of clothes to identify where technology and innovation could fit into this fast fashion industry. It starts off with the materials and fibers, the basic raw materials of textile production. Natural fibers like cotton, flax, leather, wool, and silk are made of, are of plant or animal origin, whereas man-made or synthetic fibers like polyester can be derived from oil or obtained through chemical transformation. 
Next, the garments are produced from the raw material. When spun and woven, fibers are converted to threads and then to fabrics. And to get vivid colors and finishes, yarns and fabrics are dyed and approved through physical and chemical processes. During tailoring and sewing, pieces of fabric are cut into shapes and joined together. And to finish, garments are cleaned, pressed, and prepared for sale. And once ready to be sold in stores or online, the finished clothes are packaged and transported to a warehouse or retail store by air, sea, or land. Then a customer buys a garment, wears it for as long as they want, and takes care of it as they wish. And the life cycle of clothing usually ends at disposal, when it's no longer used. Clothes often end up incinerated or in landfills. At the moment, our clothing follows a linear economy, a, a make-take waste model. The fashion industry is fueled by a linear model in which costs are reduced and production is sped up at the expense of the environment and people. While our linear fashion economy allows companies to keep up with customer demand and increase, increase profits, it also is very unsustainable and wasteful. So of the many problems caused by fast fashion and our linear economy, I just want to touch on three major ones. Textile waste, carbon emissions, and water consumption and pollution. Fast fashion is disposable fashion, leading to huge quantities of waste. Because the trendy clothes are short-lasting and they quickly go out of style, they quickly, they're quickly discarded and pile up in landfills. Polyester, a plastic in a, found in about 60% of clothing, doesn't degrade and persists in the environment decades after being thrown out. Every second, the equivalent of one garbage truck full of clothes is burned or dumped in a landfill. And instead of being recycled, 85% of textiles are dumped into landfills or burned each year. Carbon emissions. The fashion industry emits 8 to 10% of all man-made carbon emissions. And this is more than international flights and maritime, and maritime shipping combined. The fashion, in fast fashion supply chains, carbon is emitted during um, fiber production, clothing shipment from factories to retail outlets, and incineration. So at every step of the way, carbon is emitted. And water consumption and pollution. And because of the leftover water from the dyeing process, it, and it's dumped uh, in ditches, streams, and rivers, the fashion industry is the world's second largest polluter of water. Furthermore, when washed, clothing items lose microfibers, which settle as sediments in oceans and enter the bodies of marine animals. 7,500 liters of water are needed to make a single pair of jeans, equivalent to the amount of water that the average person drinks over seven years. And half a million tons of microfiber is dumped into the ocean every year, the equivalent of three million barrels of oil. Thing is, the fashion industry doesn't have to be so polluting and harmful. The issues of textile waste, carbon emissions, and water consumption and pollution don't have to be so bad. To reduce waste, producti to reduce waste productively use our resources, better address resource scarcity issues, and decrease the environmental impacts of our production and consumption, we must transition from a linear fashion economy to a circular one. In a circular fashion model, items are designed, produced, um, sourced, and provided with the goal of being responsibly used and effectively circulating in their life cycle for as long as possible. Sustainable fashion in a circular economy must be designed with high longevity, resource efficiency, non-toxicity, biodegradability, recyclability, and good ethics at the forefront. Thankfully, technology could promote a traceable, transparent, and more sustainable fashion industry for businesses, consumers, and the planet. Now, I want to share six areas of innovation in the fashion industry that, to enable the transition from a linear economy to a circular one. I'm really excited about the possibility of biofabricating alternative textiles. This means using cells, proteins, and biological materials to manufacture fabrics. Garments have already been made of everything from citrus fruits to cow manure, whereas textile dyes consisting of bacteria and plants have already been developed. Three companies in the space of sustainable biomaterials are Alginet, who is creating uh, yarn from kelp, uh, one of the most renewable organisms on Earth. From seaweed to fibers, Alginet is developing functional and accessible biomaterials to revolutionize the textile industry. We have Modern Meadow using the principles of cell biology to create animal-free sustainable materials. This company recently produced lab-grown leather through a process of DNA editing that grows collagen, which is the protein in skin, from yeast. And we have Bolt Threads, a company that was able to produce the proteins that replicate the process of spider, real spider silk by fermentation after studying the uh, DNA of spiders and the properties of their silk. So these products uh, fabricated by the three companies have a lesser environmental impact and are biodegradable. 
Similarly to biofabricating alternative textiles, we can also call on biology to revolutionize the fashion industry by using biomimicry for fashion. By definition, biomimicry is the design and production of materials, structures, and systems that are modeled after biological organisms and processes. To create more sustainable materials, we won't just be copying the color combinations and patterns found in nature. Rather, we'll examine nature and borrow elements to make clothes that are self-repairing, self-cleaning, preserve energy, waterproof, and more. Who knows? Someday, our clothes might interact with our bodies, reacting to our emotions and social environment. So examples of using biomimicry in fashion are mimicking shark skin on swimsuits to improve swimmer performance or producing a fibers inspired by butterfly wings that can change in tone and intensity without pigment or dye. And um, $120 billion worth of excess fabric sits in fa factories, mills, and warehouses at any given time because sellers often aren't sure how much unused fabric they have and where it is coming from. Thankfully, technologies like blockchain and artificial intelligence can actually identify areas of waste within the fashion supply chain. So introducing Queen of Raw, a marketplace to buy and sell unused fabrics by tracking where certain materials come from, what sustainable certifications they may have, and where they are headed from cotton fields to closets. As waste streams are identified, it's possible to prevent fabrics from getting discarded and effectively repurpose. By 20 repurpose them. So by 2025, Queen of War could save 4 billion gallons of water and keep 2 million pounds of chemicals and uh, so 2 million tons of textiles out of landfills. This is just an example of using blockchain and AI to reduce waste, create a more transparent supply chain, and trace the history of garments. To avoid economic and environmental waste, we could equally track and claim clothes through their cycle with digital identification and IoT systems. This is exactly what Eon is doing. With their platform, they're looking to connect our clothes to transform the way we buy by providing every garment a digital identity. So information about each garment is recorded as it travels through its life cycle. Embedded tags like QR codes, RFID, NFC, Bluetooth LE can reveal where a good was made and who actually made it. And Eon allows brands to gain data and insights on new customer demands, as well as to adopt more eco-conscious business models like rental, resale, exchanges, reuse, and recycling. With IoT systems, Eon could meet our demand for transparency, traceability, and visibility in the fashion industry. And if 3D printers manufactured clothes, brands could produce clothes on demand, a when-needed basis. What does this mean for the environment? Well, 3D textile printing is far less labor-intensive than current production methods and reduces fabric waste by about 35%. There is a real opportunity there. And thrifting, which is an environmentally friendly alternative to purchasing, from, uh, purchasing clothes from fast fashion, can keep clothes out of landfills by giving them a second chance. So to facilitate the secondhand shopping experience, consignment and thrift stores are moving online. And so this is what ThreadUp is doing, a fashion retail platform that enables consumers to buy and sell garments. The company has upcycled 100 million items across America, the equivalent of 870,000 tons of carbon emissions. ThreadUp relies on the artificial intelligence services of View AI, the process incoming items thanks to image recognition. AI assigns a resale value to each unique item based on characteristics such as necklines, patterns, label name, color, fashion edginess, and more. By using artificial intelligence, ThreadUp can tackle the inefficiencies of traditional thrift stores while scaling its operations to more areas. As slow and sustainable fashion gains popularity among eco-consumers, um, it is more, it's a real opportunity to consumer, uh, there's a real opportunity to revolutionize thrifting technology, to improve user experience, and to make quality secondhand more accessible. From early global, from early personal sewing machines to globalized productions, the fashion industry has evolved a great deal. And because some of the applications I mentioned are still in their infancy, it's a rhyme time for you and I to work on creating fashionable impact. So it's time to focus on, and it's time to focus on and pioneer circular fashion for businesses, consumers, and the planet. So my question to you is, how will you create fashionable change? Yay! That was such a good talk. Oh my god, the confidence. I love that. Um, and it's such an important talk topic, right? Um, and especially right now with you know clothing trends coming in, um, it's it is a problem. And fast fashion has been a problem for a long time. And I think it's a great like spot to kind of use the technology that is emerging right now and apply that there to create a more sustainable world. Um, so thank you once again. So. That was 
literally big brain information being thrown at us, and that's great. Um, so audience, send your questions. If you have questions, just drop them in the chat. Um, and we're gonna wait a little, just have them come in. So yeah, question from Christina. Do you think implementing these innovations into mainstream fashion will increase the price of clothing? I think that's a really great concern to have just because as I mentioned, fast fashion has enabled people from different socioeconomic backgrounds to like pursue trends and to have clothing that is cool and that makes them feel accepted. And so the last thing we want is to uh, only have clothing that is uh, like technology, like technologically advanced and not have any people who actually want it or need it to be able to purchase it. Um, so I, I think at first the cost will be high um, and that is just, a matter of time before we really see an, a widespread adoption of these methods that are more eco-friendly. And I feel like a good measure we could take to decrease the price of these clothing would be to provide subsidies or to implement um, like legislation that makes that um, that encourages companies to uh, ethically and sustainably source their materials and to seek alternative production methods that um, will not drastically increase the price of clothing. And so I think uh, these in innovations will be costly at first, but uh, as just like fusion energy, it is an investment. Yeah, I agree. Um, but yeah, any other questions? I'm just gonna wait like a minute since we are ahead of schedule. Um, we shall wait. If not, um, Emiel, you could also answer questions in the chat directly and interact with, ooh, we have one from Kimberly. Okay. <laughs> okay, so how will consumer behavior change with the implementation of these innovations? Oh, I think that's a super valuable question to ask because um, as of now, consumer behavior is very much uh, like fueling fast fashion. Um, and and in, in the sense where we, we really do not want, we want to move away from this model of uh, always taking and, and using and then wasting. I think we would really have to be more mindful of how long we want to care for and uh, treat or treat these uh, innovations. So in the sense where we're purchasing clothes that um, are meant to last longer, that have, that are more comfy and that have a better environmental footprint, I hope we're incentivized to keep them for a longer time and to uh, not pursue these fast fashion trends that are constantly presented to us. I think uh, there will have, there's definitely the consumer aspect to consider with these innovations um, and how they will react and respond and how, how, how they'll be willing to uh, adopt them. But um, I think consumer behavior will also be more eco-conscious and that really appreciate the uh, advantages that these innovations uh, will bring. And I hope that they will also just improve their consumer patterns by not purchasing what they don't need and by also uh, fueling this uh, circular fashion model. Yeah, I also think that an important thing is educating the public on this because I think just kind of implementing technology right away might yeah even bring shock to some people. It might just not be in their kind of realm of like thoughts or like, you know, decision makings. And so it's really important to educate the public and which is why we are also running these talks to educate everyone about, you know, what is emerging and what we can do, right? To create a more sustainable world. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, um, without any further to do, we will move on to our next speaker, um, Samson. So Samson, is a 18 year old entrepreneur from New York who is currently researching wireless um, power transmission technology to advance the vision of SSP. And he hopes to inspire the youth to not fear ambition, but rather challenge yourself and create real impact in fighting environmental crisis. So welcome Samson. Thank you, thank you. I forgot how like uh, dramatic I made my, my bio. Uh, I definitely hope to, to inspire you guys, but uh, yeah, hope you guys enjoy. So let me go in. Share my screen. Okay, there we go. All right, so like Nyla, I'm gonna be talking about um, a vision for a potential uh, renewable energy source. So I'm gonna be talking about one that you probably heard a lot less about and that's called space solar power. Um, and even though it's less discussed, it has a lot of really exciting promise. So I'm excited to share it with you guys today. So we use energy for a ton of things, whether it's our personal devices or transportation, or manufacturing, processing, shipping, all the things that happen behind the scenes. Humanity's energy consumption has skyrocketed in the last few decades, and it's projected to not stop growing anytime soon. 
Um, the EIA, the uh, United States um, Energy uh, Information Agency, I believe, uh, projects that there will be a nearly 50% increase in world energy usage by 2050. The problem is that most of this energy that we consume is created by burning fossil fuels. Uh, it's been this way for the past few centuries, um, and even with the rise of new renewable and clean energy sources, the increasing energy demand has meant that oil, coal, and gas have still been the primary sources of energy production. And the problem with burning fossil fuels, um, I'm sure you guys all know, is that it causes climate change. It causes carbon emissions, and carbon emissions causes climate change. Um, and climate change means that ecosystems will be destroyed. Sea levels are going to rise. Uh, natural disasters will happen more often and all sorts of other problems. And even aside from climate change, uh, coal, gas, and oil, fossil fuels are inherently non-renewable resources. We are going to run out of them. And at our current rate uh, of using them, we're going to run out of them within the next few decades and the next century. So it's clear whether your angle is uh, on preventing climate change or just simply on preserving our ability to use energy and run human civilization the way that it has, that we need clean and sustainable energy sources. We need innovation and we need new things to replace the vast amounts of fossil fuels that we're currently burning for energy production. So let's first talk about a few uh, of the most common sources of sustainable energy. So the first is nuclear, so nuclear in its current state. Um, an advantage of nuclear is that there are more or less no operating emissions. Uh, there's no carbon emissions from generating power from nuclear energy. Um, and for another, uh, unlike solar and wind energy, nuclear power output is fairly consistent. Uh, you're not relying on weather, you're not relying on environmental conditions uh, for how much energy you're able to put out. However, there are a lot of drawbacks in nuclear power as well. It's very energy intensive to construct nuclear power stations requiring a ton of cement and metal um, and fuel as well. Uh, the mining of uranium takes a ton of resources as well as the processing of that uranium into fuel for nuclear fission. Furthermore, uranium is a non-renewable resource. It's mined out of the ground um, and it is going to run out in 80 to 200 years at our current rate of use. And thirdly, uh, nuclear power, nuclear fission creates radioactive waste just that, prevents, uh, that presents a continuous problem that you have to deal with. So now let's talk about hydropower. Hydropower is the most common form of renewable energy, and it's been around the longest. It generates 17% of the world's electricity. Again, there are more or less no operating emissions. Um, and again, compared to solar and wind, uh, there's a very consistent output. It doesn't depend as much on weather or environmental conditions. Uh, however, hydropower has its downsides too. Um, it, has in, it, has in, it has a potential impact on the local environment, disturbing the local ecology and ecosystems. Uh, and furthermore, there's a limited amount of sites that are very suitable for building dams and reservoirs, so that in many countries, uh, like the United States, um, it's, it's actually like tending towards saturation. So it becomes more and more expensive to build well operating hydropower stations over time uh, to the point where it becomes no longer feasible. And lastly, let's talk about solar and wind. So again, these are clean energy sources with no operating emissions, and they're much more versatile to install. Uh, you can throw them on rooftops, you can throw them uh, in, in open fields, uh, wherever you have. But the big problem with solar and wind is that output is very inconsistent. It's dependent on weather. If you don't have wind, you can't generate wind power. If it's night, uh, or there's simply a lot of cloud cover, you can't generate solar power. So None of this is to say that we should dismiss these options. Obviously, these renewable energy sources have had a huge impact and they will and should continue to be pursued. However, even with just these sources, it's clear that we're not actually making that much of a dent in energy consumption by fossil fuels. So in 1990, from 1965 to 1990, we made a great deal of progress. We went from 6% of energy generated from low carbon sources, including renewable energy, as well as uh, nuclear energy, to 14% in 1990. But from 1990 to 2019, over this 30-year period, we went from 14% to 16%. We basically made no progress. And when you zoom out and look at the overall uh, overall energy consumption, it's clear that the vast majority of energy is still being generated using fossil fuels and the absolute amount of fossil fuels being burned is still going up. Uh, so it's clear that we need more innovation. We need more effort uh, and more advocacy put into clean energy sources. So I'm going to present, uh, so yeah, so now I had a really amazing, uh, really amazing uh, presentation on uh, nuclear fusion and, and one approach. And um, there's lots of other approaches. And so today I'm going to present one that you probably heard less about, and it's called space solar power. And even though you've heard less about it, it's really promising. Uh, it's, it's really promising as a large scale uh, and reliable renewable energy source that solves a lot of the problems of uh, the other most more common current renewable energy sources that we have implemented. So the idea of space solar power is basically what it sounds like. Instead of having a solar, an array of solar panels on Earth, we put it on a satellite and ship it out into space, 36,000 kilometers up in geostationary orbit. It was first proposed by NASA engineer Peter Glazer in 1968. So once you have this array of solar panels in space, uh, energy is generated using sunlight in space and then beamed down wireless to, wirelessly to the Earth via an antenna that sends microwaves. So why would you want to do this? Well, let's take a look at a terrestrial solar, uh, terrestrial solar panel. 
So a big problem, as I mentioned earlier, is that when you put a solar panel on the ground, most of the time, you're not actually able to access the energy that comes from the sun, whether that's because it's night uh, or because there's simply a lot of cloud cover and weather that's getting in your way and preventing the sunlight from going through. Um, on aggregate, you're only getting about 15% uh, availability of sunlight with a photovoltaic solar panel. For another, because the sunlight is traveling through hundreds of kilometers of atmosphere before it reaches the solar panel, it attenuates a lot. It loses a lot of its energy. It gets scattered off. Um, and on the ground, you're only getting 140 watts per square meter of power density. Compare that to if you put solar panels in space. When you put a satellite in geostationary orbit, it can actually stay in sunlight for the vast majority of the year. So you never end up in the Earth's shadow and never end up in the night cycle. So uh, sunlight is available upwards of 90% of the year. For another, because it's in space and sunlight doesn't have to go through the atmosphere, the power density is much higher um, at 1400 watts compared to 140 on the ground. Even when you account for the 15% transmission loss, um, that is pretty state-of-the-art transmission loss for beaming uh, micro beaming electricity via microwaves through 36,000 kilometers of space and atmosphere, that's still a 30 times improvement in the relative amount of energy produced. So you guys, some of you guys might have heard of SpaceX's Starlink constellation. It's this idea to put 30,000 satellites in lower Earth orbit, forming this network that provides internet access to everywhere on Earth. It's a really wild idea. Now, imagine if each one of these satellites had solar panels on them and a microwave antenna that could beam electricity down, clean electricity down to anywhere on Earth. It would revolutionize the way that we generate and distribute power. So this is a really amazing vision. Uh, is it actually possible? The short answer is yes, it 100% is, and it has been since the 60s and 70s. So William Brown was a NASA engineer who pioneered microwave wireless power transmission. Uh, in 1968, he had this really famous demo where he uh, took a helicopter, he put a uh, receiving antenna on the bottom of it, shot microwaves up at it, and kept it afloat for 10 hours purely by the microwaves that he beamed to it. Uh, seven years later, he followed up with an experiment beaming um, 400 kilowatts of power across more than a mile uh, across California from this antenna to a receiving antenna a mile away. And since then, more research has been done by other groups as well. Um, so on the left here is a uh, experiment called SHARP by the Canadian uh, Communications Research Center, where they powered a plane wirelessly uh, by microwave. So a real plane out in the field, not in a lab, not in a controlled experiment. Um, and in 2015, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries um, have, been, have been doing uh, these continuous experiments, um, again, increasing the range, increasing the efficiency, uh, and designing these, testing out these large-scale wireless power transmission technologies. So the research has been there. And this is not just in the lab, too, or in abstract. NASA, uh, the Japanese Space Agency, and uh, European Space Agency and other groups all have put really serious consideration uh, into this idea of space solar power. So in 1997, NASA commissioned a fresh look study um, that gave a really positive assessment saying that space solar power may well emerge as a serious candidate among the options for meeting the energy demands of the 21st century. Japan has had serious plans, uh, ha has in the past decade, has in the past few years, uh, came up with a really serious roadmap. They plan to have a commercial implementation of space solar power within the next 25 years. So there's all this momentum behind it. This technology has been there since the 80s. We had this study in 1997 about how this is feasible. Why hasn't space solar power happened yet? Why don't we have satellites in orbit beaming us down electricity? Well, there's one key detail that I haven't told you about yet, um, and that's kind of getting into the physics. So there's no fancy physics here. There's nothing that we don't know how to do. However, just by the limitations of the physics, um, by the power density of the solar panels, as well as uh, just the transmission efficiency equations, um, the, solar, the space solar power satellite is going to have to be multiple kilometers in scale. So that circular antenna you see on the screen there, that has to be a kilometer in diameter in order to efficiently beam down power 36,000 kilometers down to the Earth. Um, and even at 1,400 watts per square meter, you're still going to need multiple square kilometers of solar panels in order to generate the kilowatts and gigawatts of power that are going to make such a, a space solar power station feasible. So obviously, this is a really huge endeavor. Um, and in the 70s and 80s, when this concept was first proposed, this kind of endeavor was exactly what was on people's minds coming off of the success of the space age. Uh, people were thinking about how to scale up further. People were thinking of these big ideas. But when NASA, when the Department of Energy, when Congress went and conducted studies, uh, when they actually looked at the numbers, it's clear to see why this was not carried through. So looking at the launch cost, just the launch cost, right? So this is an estimate, a gigawatt scale uh, space solar power station. Um, would require 10,000, uh, is going to weigh 10,000 tons, right? You're going to have to put 10,000 tons of stuff into orbit to get this space solar power station operating and delivering one gigawatt uh, of power. If you look at just the launch cost for this uh, by the space shuttle, which is operational from 1981 to, uh, to 2011, um, and the cheapest and easiest way to send large amounts of cargo to orbit, uh, the space shuttle could only cargo carry 32 tons of cargo per flight. Um, and it sent it up 
at a cost of more than $50,000 per kilogram. So just in terms of launching a power station up, a gigawatt scale power station, it would have cost $450 billion on the space shuttle, uh, not to mention all the costs that has to be put into construction and maintenance and all the other things to worry about. So in comparison, a one gigawatt scale nuclear power plant currently takes about six to $9 billion to build. And one gigawatt of commercial solar panels costs about $2 billion to deploy. So it's very clear why Congress took a look at these numbers and went, no, there are much better things to invest in. But the thing is, a lot of innovation has been happening in the past few years, past few decades uh, in space tech. So if we look at more recent solutions, uh, the Falcon, SpaceX's Falcon 9 lowered the cost to orbit uh, to $2,700 per kilogram, although it can only carry nine tons per flight. That lowers the launch cost to $24 billion, which although still a lot more than these other alternatives, begins to look a lot more reasonable. And then if we look farther out into the future, into the innovation that's currently happening and the projections for what uh, the cost of launching to space might look like just in the near future, if we look at SpaceX's Starship, um, Starship is, is set to have a capacity of 150 tons of cargo per flight and a cost as low as $20 per kilogram. So if you look at the launch cost, then it comes down to just about $180 million, which puts it at, uh, which makes it an actual, an amount that you can actually start thinking about and thinking about how it can be feasible. So um, yeah, so there's a lot of really exciting innovation that, uh, going on that makes it ever more and more feasible to consider this concept. Now, there are other limitations as well. So just to put things in scope, the global energy demand in 2019 was 173,000 terawatt hours per year. One gigawatt scale space, uh, space solar power station. So that's the 10,000 tons multi-kilometer scale structure that has been in the reference designs for the past few years. Um, generates nine terawatt hours per year of electricity. That means that if you wanted to cover the entire demand, uh, entire global energy demand, you would need 19,000 space solar power stations, which is probably not feasible, probably not going to happen. And to match current renewable sources, you would need 200, uh, you would need 200 space solar power stations to match solar, for example, and 770 to match nuclear, which, although a lot more feasible, is still, still pretty wild numbers. Um, and zooming out even more, we see that electricity production is only 25% of contributions to global greenhouse gas emissions. Agriculture uh, and other land use contributes another quarter. Um, transportation, uh, transportation contributes 14%. Um, and you have all these other industries, all these other sectors that contribute more. So even if we get space solar power into orbit, even if we get it as a sustainable energy source producing 100% of our electricity, we still have the rest of climate change. We still have the rest of global, uh, global carbon emissions to deal with, uh, with technologies like cellular agriculture, vertical farming for agriculture or uh, electric vehicles and other transportation innovations uh, to deal with transportation emissions. But all these limitations aside, it's really exciting that we have these kind of concepts. And any limitation presented here is simply a limitation to be overcome. So on the right here is a concept that was submitted, a research proposal that was submitted actually to a European Space Agency contest that just closed in January 2021. Um, and it proposes this idea of lunar, uh, of, a, of a lunar power station um, that collects solar, uh, that collects sunlight from the moon, puts solar powers uh, in orbit around the moon, and then beams it back to the Earth, which has several advantages. Uh, you can have a greater amount of power generation and other limitations that it's going to be able to overcome. And there's lots of other active research being done to overcome various other limitations of space solar power. And the point here is not necessarily that this is going to be the solution, right? That this is going to be the solution that we should focus on rather than nuclear, rather than all these other things, but simply that we, there's a lot of potential when we look beyond the status quo, when we dare to innovate, when we dare to explore these wild concepts and see the impact that they could possibly have. That's how innovation happens. We break out of what we know, uh, what we expect to be possible and come up with these new ideas for how to solve the world's biggest problems. So this is something personally that I'm really excited about, that I'm spending my time researching uh, over these next few months and seeing if I can come up with uh, meaningful research and, and give a meaningful contribution to the field. And I hope this inspires you to pursue whatever it is that you're interested in that could potentially have a really high impact, whether that's nuclear fusion or cellular agriculture or whatever other uh, uh, sustainability aiming uh, in high impact projects that you might want to work on. So, oh no, my last slide is not linked, but so that is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, and yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, space solar power is definitely an inter interesting approach that we don't really talk about. And I'm like honestly surprised that we aren't using this right now despite the barriers. Um, but like, just imagine if we were to really implement that, deploy that, um, how the world will change, how we, you know, use our renewable sources. It's really going to change dramatically.
Um, so thank you for dropping that knowledge bomb. <laughs> and so, yeah, we will take questions. Um, I'm looking. Um, okay, we could wait a little for questions to come in. But yeah, definitely, that was such an interesting talk. So thank you. Um, let's see. Cool. Okay, I'm going to wait a little for questions to come in. Okay, Ian asked, how do you see energy ownership working country by country? Yeah, this is a really, really interesting um, question. I guess I, I like dive less into the, the politics and, and business necessarily like nationalized energy and whatnot. But also like on a very related note, um, one one uh, thing that has come up when discussing space solar power is that uh, like the International Space Station, this kind of thing would be much more feasible to construct if you had the space agencies of multiple countries working together, right, to launch these huge structures into orbit. Um, and it's very interesting, too, that a lot of uh, initiatives so far have been fairly nationalized. So uh, I know that in the U.S., for example, the leading group doing research on space solar power is actually the, the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory, which has been somewhat secretive about its plans. Um, in Japan, it's been the Japanese Space Agency, which has its own roadmap, uh, kind of not really relying on... Um, not really relying on international contributions uh, so much as doing its own research, launching its own demonstrations and trying to push forward, uh, push, uh, push their country's vision forward themselves. Um, and then China as well has a very nationalized uh, like 25 year roadmap for getting uh, space solar power up. So I think it's kind of interesting to think about um, to me, I guess I view this in the context of I'm a bit of a space nerd. So kind of in the in the context of like space and international relations overall in that, you know, you had the period in the 60s, 70s uh, after the space race where there was a period of, of a lot of collaboration right, that still goes on. But uh, there's a lot more politics attached to it, or there's just very different politics to attach to it in the present day where there's less international collaboration or at least less open international collaboration um, and things are more nationalized, which I guess is, is just um, a reflection of the larger international relations like uh, nationalistic politics that are going around going on around the globe today but it's a very interesting it's a very interesting question and it'll be very interesting to see you know when one of these space agencies gets um, starts getting these space stations up and starts generating gigawatts of power um, and has a lot of economic return from uh, you know space infrastructure how the politics are going to change how the regulations uh, are going to change around it yeah um so yeah sky asked do the rockets that ship the energy units up to space use a tons of emissions? And if so, when would the benefits of space energy offset the environmental costs of these launches? That's a great question. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. So this is actually something I, I've been meaning to look into and haven't haven't much yet, haven't gotten specific numbers yet. Um, so yeah, for sure, that that's going to be a big um, a big consideration. My uh, I guess the thoughts I do have on it is that when you take any sort of um, like big energy solution. Um, it when you zoom out enough, all the construction costs kind of fade away. Um, where it's like even when like space solar power was like a four hundred fifty billion dollar project, like I believe like NASA's reports in the eighties were like two hundred fifty billion dollars to first kilowatt hour. They were still like it's economically feasible because if you really zoom out, it is economically feasible. You're going to make trillions and trillions of profit on whatever the upfront costs are. Um, and that's in terms of economics, but kind of similar here, right? Uh, just that finite launch cost is going to provide, um, you know terawatt hours and terawatt hours um, of clean energy. But it is definitely something something to look into um, and something that I think there is continuous innovation on, uh, right? Like SpaceX is like uh, Raptor engines are a lot more efficient uh, using a closed loop system. Um, yeah, closed loop rocket engines. Uh, there's ideas of bringing satellites to lower Earth orbit, which takes a lot less energy, and then taking it from lower Earth orbit to geosynchronous orbit or geostationary orbit, rather than taking it directly to geosynchronous orbit, uh, which would expend the rocket, which would waste a lot more energy. So yeah, so this is definitely somewhere where, again, there's a lot of parallel innovation happening in the space industry um, that is going to be really exciting to really exciting to see the progress there. Yeah, and so Ian also asked, what are the major intersections of future tech for this to truly become a reality? Yeah, um, yeah so it's, it's, it seems to me like the big one is just the second So much of the technology already exists. You can partially credit space solar power for that. Um, 
you can partially credit the spin-off, the momentum that's created from that for the researchers who researched um, wireless power transmission by uh, magnetic induction. Uh, and there's various other applications. So for me, it seems like a lot of the tech is already there. Obviously, there's going to be improvements, but like people have been saying this for four years. It's like, it's it's there's no fundament, there's no big engineering challenges, there's no big physics challenges. It just needs to happen. So for me, the one thing that has been unsolved that does require like more innovation is uh, launch and deployment. Is just getting 10,000 tons uh, of a multi-kilometer space structure into geosynchronous orbit and then deploying it. And once we do that, that has a ton of spin-off applications um, to you know this, the future of space exploration, the future of like making humanity an interplanetary species, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so that's a, that's I think that the big thing on my mind, just like my analysis of it, is that the chasm, the gap, is in the deployment part, is in the launch part. Um, and a lot of the other technologies are in place. And then kind of throughout this process, there's a lot of parallel innovation happening on and a lot of spin-off applications that are going to come out of this. Okay, cool. I think that's it for comments for now. But if you do have further questions for Samson, maybe not even space related, maybe you know how he's learning about this, make sure to comment and Samson, you'll have access to directly reply to them. Um, but yeah, so just another reminder, if you like the talk so far, make sure to sign up for tomorrow's talk where we will be learning about cellular agriculture, cow poop, and AI. Um, so this is the link if you want to check that out. Um, but yeah, so I think it is time for our last speaker, um, our guest speaker today. Um, thank you to everyone who made it to the end. Um, but yeah, that's a link for tomorrow. So make sure to sign up if you haven't. But yeah, last but not least, our last guest speaker, Elise. Elise is a technical leader and entrepreneur. He is a co-founder of Transhumanism Australia and other health and genomic startups. And as a software engineer currently at Palo It, Elise has experience in developing products for AI and blockchain startups. And Elise is also a board member of Singularity U Australia and sits on the UN Climate Change Committee. So hi Elise, let's just jump into it. Well, how are you? Hi everyone, thanks for having me. I'm so glad to be here and what an awesome community you've built. Yeah. So yeah, pretty good. I'm, I'm feeling for everyone else who is in lockdown at the moment, but luckily in Sydney, Australia, we are, we've got it pretty good at the moment. So we're out and about. That's great. So yeah, you know, let's just jump into it. So I'm just really interested in asking today. So you're in the UN Climate Change Committee. And so as a committee member, what is something currently being discussed within the committee about climate change specifically? And what are the main concerns around? There are two things that we're currently looking at. One is how slow we are progressing in terms of keeping the emissions below or global warming below 2%, uh, 2 degrees Celsius. So then we're looking at, especially in my part of the world, we aren't really taking a lot of action. And especially because we have leaders who aren't really that concerned. So in some of the major emitters like the US, there hasn't been a lot of climate change action. And also in Australia, that is the case as well. So we haven't really made commitments towards the Paris agreements, as you may have heard. Um, so that's one of the major issues we are concerned about. And the second is that we need to get people to understand the gravity of the situation. So you've got a lot of people who are anti-science and then there's, there's a big community building around this anti-climate change, anti-science movement. And that's quite concerning. So they think it's either it, it's, it, it's not human induced or it's not such a big deal. Yeah. And so in that, like what value do you try to bring to the table as a person heavily knowledgeable from the tech perspective? So I'm not a policy person. I am probably more of a community community builder. And also I look at things from the perspective of technology, like you just mentioned. So one of my key aims at the moment is just making people understand how they can make better choices when they're developing digital products or digital solutions. So everything we do today is digital. So whether we're buying something or we're even just using some type of service. So e-commerce has really risen during the last year or so. And then any service we 
we use, like even from um, storage of photos is more online. Any service we engage, we're probably going to be using online booking systems. So for example, hairdresser or seeing the doctor and so forth. So increasingly we're using a lot of these applications. And so these applications, there's a lot of process behind that and it actually consumes a lot of energy and electricity. And so one of the things I'm working on is how we can make businesses understand how they can host their applications um, in, in greener data warehouses um, or server farms. So there's a couple of things there. So when we're thinking about how, um, how uh, what is the effect of uh, server farms is that you're either getting served something from it, um, information is getting stored there or it's getting processed there. So a lot of electricity is consumed. And so there's actually these uh, services that you can use from say Azure or AWS, which are some of the largest cloud providers. And you can actually see where you can choose um, a more greener uh, solution to, to host your applications. Now it's, you might think it's a small thing, but where you have demand that's driven by the consumer to have greener choices. So using server farms, which are um, which are powered by green energy, that actually drives a lot of momentum and impetus for businesses like Azure or AWS, these cloud providers, to choose green solutions. I see, I see. So within that like realm, what do you think is one of the most like important uh, emerging technologies that will help um, in maybe the consumer market as well as you know general climate issues and other environmental problems there's probably three main things when it comes to climate action so the first one is quite general so it's not specific to climate action um, that would be machine learning so you've already seen and heard about the google project where they were able to reduce the electricity consumption in their um, uh, server farms by up to 60 percent and that's quite significant so that's just using artificial intelligence to do that um, also, in terms of I, because I started talking about server farms, you can also use AI to make it a lot more efficient. So, for example, you can choose when you have more demand for for um, for your services, then you can use AI to predict when you'll have more demand for them. So you can spin up more servers or you can spin down less services as you need it. And so that means that you just reduce uh, electricity consumption rather than just always having these computers on. I might have, um, so servers are just literally like a, um, you can think of it as a supercomputer, more powerful than the one that you currently have and are using. And it's just in a remote location where you can host your websites and other applications. Um, so there are the two other ones which are more climate related. So the first one is green hydrogen. So that's just using, um, uh, so you need three things to make hydrogen. Uh, I think it's uh, electrolysis and uh, water and then some sort of energy. And if you use a green energy, it means that it's green hydrogen. There are other types of hydrogen, but it's just not green. Um, so that is quite important um, in terms of using an alternative energy source that is uh, that is just as good as um, the current sources of energies that these these um, massive industrial processes use. So in Australia, for example, we have this company called Fortescue's. They are iron ore miners, and they are saying that they are completely overhauling their processes in their company to use green hydrogen. So that is quite unprecedented. You've also got BP and Shell who are looking at um, using green hydrogen and building these plants just for that. Um, then you've got also a, a bit related to green hydrogen, but, um, but more for, for the consumer side is where you can bring the, the source of energy much closer to you. So using solar panels is very important. So you're just getting energy directly rather than having to um, en enable or even support these massive this massive in infrastructure and these services just to get energy to your house. So literally, it's, energy is really expensive right now. And, and that's what contributes to the cost 
of a lot of the things, services you use or the products that you use. So you have to dig it out of the ground and then you have to refine it somehow. And then they have to say um, for gasoline or, or petrol, they have to transport it to the, the gas station. And then it gets into your um, car somehow. But that is really energy intensive. It's, it's labor and energy intensive it, it, and it's expensive. And it's actually quite inefficient because um, there's, I think one of the laws of thermodynamics is that um, energy tends to spread out. Uh, so entropy, so where the, the probability of um, of something spreading out is uh, like that is that is an important thing to to understand about energy. So if you can eliminate all these processes behind having to do this just to get energy to our homes or to our cars, and we can just get it directly from the the source itself, which is the sun. It's one of the most powerful sources of energy, and you can harness it, and it, it's you know right on your home or in your car. Then that is the important step in in terms of. Uh, getting to um, sustainability and, and greener choices. Um, the third is carbon capture technology. So capturing the carbon dioxide um, from any emissions. So Exxon, Exxon Mobil, uh, I think they're just called Exxon at the moment. They are building a plant, um, a, a power plant, um, where they are implementing a lot of the carbon capture technology. Also, I think a, a few years ago, a company came out to to um, create jewelry where you can like order a ring and you can wear carbon on your finger. <laughs> yeah, that's a little quirky, but I mean, <laughs> and also I feel like all these problems, like you know with the emerging technology the students talked about today, like those will all contribute to creating a sustainable future. And so speaking about like all these new, you know, emerging technologies coming out and things of that sort, I'm sure a lot of students here and the youth here um, might have ideas in pursuing computer science or any of, you know, STEM subjects in the future and careers. So what are current issues and trends in the field that they should know about and they should be aware about before going in? I think CS is awesome and useful for absolutely everything, even if you don't intend on working in technology, because just everything will be technology. So you'll, you'll probably want to understand at least the basics of it. Three things I think people should be aware of is, firstly, that programming is increasingly becoming a blue collar job. So essentially, I'm just a blue collar job. It's not that sexy. Um, and th the reason why is because it's, uh, front-end development, so creating the UI, for example, is increasingly becoming commoditized. So what that means is things just are identical or look identical. And so you're just competing on price in the end. That is also similarly applying to the more software engineering side of things. So the back end um, of, of uh, applications where usually it's a little bit more complex and it's less commoditized. But the second trend is actually affecting that. And that is that coding is increasingly becoming automated. You've already seen what GPT-3 is doing. So GPT-3 is this API service that was released by OpenAI. OpenAI is, was co-founded by Elon Musk and this other guy, I can't remember his name. He's from Y Combinator um, and a couple of others. So... With GPT-3, I have actually been playing around with it at work and it is pretty impressive. It can actually do a large chunk of my job for me. So, it, so it's important to keep this in mind because the, the software development jobs that you see today just won't be as abundant in the future. So when you graduate and you're looking for a job in maybe, say, I don't know, five, three to five years time, the market will look significantly different. But then you've got to extrapolate even further into the future. And, you're, and the, that brings me to my third point, which is that the, the jobs will be in really nascent industries. So things like terraforming, neuroanalytics, um, asteroid mining. So like the previous talk, we were talking a lot about space exploration and, and space industries. That is an increasingly um, uh, big opportunity that a lot of the big tech companies are going after. So a way to look at where the industry is heading and CS will always be uh, useful and required in these cases is, is seeing where the investment is, where are they pouring new money um, into and, and that's where the jobs will be. 
yeah, I think that just will open up opportunities and uh, opportunities and opportunities um, as, you know, trends come in. And I think, yeah, it's really important to keep up with those trends if you are looking towards going in that path. Um, but yeah, so to the next question about your startups, how were you able to build three startups and were they all successes? And if not, what would you have done differently with your startups? Yeah, that's that's a good one. So I was just reading Samson's comment about blue collar makes 100K. Yeah, that's true. I mean, like if you work at one of the big tech companies, you make even more than that. So it's a pretty good blue collar job. <laughs> um so back to back to startups yeah so no i wouldn't say they're all successes and and that's okay that's a good thing because you learn something from why they failed so you hopefully don't make the same mistake and um so what did work for me is the the third one i built which is transhumanism australia it is a community but we also have some revenue streams coming from that. But it's more about we we make that money so we can continue investing in the community rather than as, as something that we run as a business. What would I have done differently? Well, when I think about it, there's three things that kill startups, especially early stage startups. So, and this is actually um, told to me by a VC. They said it's either co-founders, capital or customers. So with co-founders, usually you just have a falling out or you just don't agree with a vision. And that's actually one of the cases for me. We, we didn't talk, we didn't talk enough in the beginning about where we saw the company in five years. What was our aim or what was our vision? And so when we were about six months into it, we realized that we didn't have the same vision. So I, I would be much more careful in um, in understanding if my co-founders had the same vision. The second is capital, which I didn't really have a problem with. Usually a lot of these startups are thinking about how they can raise money. Raise, raising money takes a lot of time. It could take you out of the business for about three to six months. And in that three to six months, you could have been working on building up a customer base and actually getting some revenue in, uh, which would actually put you in an even better position to, to raise more money. So it, it's it's a real problem, this, this capital thing. Or, or I, I would like... I would actually go back and not try and build a business which was based on the premise of needing to raise money so that I can I can build it. it raising money to grow is is okay, but if you need money to build it, it it's a real problem. Uh, the third one is customers. So not talking to customers when you just start building something and not understanding it, what they want so you can't achieve that product market fit they always talk about. That was kind of a problem for us, I guess. We, we actually, it was okay. It For us, it was probably more of a co-founder problem. So yeah, that's the things that were done differently. Yeah, I mean, that's great insight. Um, I didn't know much about that, but if, you know, if anyone here is like trying to start a startup, um, you just got a knowledge bomb. So make sure to jot that down. Um, but yeah, so I know you briefly talked about uh, transhumanism um, Australia. Um, so I'm sure some people might not know of transhumanism, what that word means. And um, so, yeah, can you explain a little bit further about what it really means and how can we as a society prepare and anticipate for that future? Transhumanism is it's misrepresented in the media, but all it really is is how we can use science and technology to enhance ourselves biologically. So how can we overcome the limitations of our human biology? So, uh, for example, our eyes. Our eyes can only see up to a particular resolution. So can we use technology to enhance the, the ability of our eyes to see um, higher resolutions, say, I don't know. I think it's past. Is it like I, I can't remember what we can't see past. Um, but uh, for example, I think something um, past 8K, it's it's not very discernible to the human eye. Uh, I think according to some MIT research, uh, I could be wrong on that number. So what what it what it is, like I explained, 
that is actually transhumanism is is already happening. So, I mean, it's really we're enhancing ourselves um, biologically just by using our phones because it's an extension of our intelligence. So we don't actually store information in our brain anymore, like a lot of people say. We just store information on where to retrieve that data. So the, the phone or the internet is our, our, I guess, where we store our data now. Um, and how do we prepare for it? I think a good place to start is by reading three books that I really love. And the first one is Superintelligence by Nick Bostrom. He is the person who proposed the idea that we're living in a simulation and uh, we're not living in base reality. So that is a really good one to start with. And the second one is by Michio Kaku. He is a theoretical physicist and he writes about, it's called The Future of the Mind, and he writes about how we could potentially, say, mind upload. We don't really need our physical bodies. Um, and this, the third one is Lifespan, Why We Age by David Sinclair. He's a Harvard professor and a gerontologist, so he studies the, the science of ageing, why we ageing. So I think it covers three really good basics of uh, all the tenets of what transhumanism is. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to have to read some of them. Um, and so I educate myself. But no, it's really important that um, the society, I know, like you said, it's coming in, it's already here. But, you know, gene editing and things that might, you know, have ethical concerns and things of that sort of haven't really been applied yet. And so it's important to educate the society on, you know, what is coming. And so that, you know, in the future, when we do reach times of, you know, where gene editing becomes implemented to enhance some of our features, um, like how are laws going to come and how is policy going to come in here? And so how is government going to come in here? So like, there's a lot of things to talk about there. Um, but honestly, yeah, it, it is an important topic to talk about. Yeah, I, I wanted to share this story. So uh, chip implants in the hand are getting quite popular. And in Sweden, a whole company got their employees all chipped so they, they could use this chip as their entry card to the office. Mm. And one of my friends, his name is Meow Ludo Meow Meow. That's his real name. He <laughs> changed his name by Vipol and, and it was like crowdsourced. <laughs> so um, Meow, he, he actually, um, so he programs, he has a chip inserted in his hand. It's actually really tiny. It's, it's about the size of a grain of rice. So it's not that invasive. Literally, you can just get a tattoo artist to, to just like insert it right there. And then he programmed, oh, actually no. What he did is he, he did have that the tiny chip implanted, but additionally, he cut out that chip that is in his transport card. So in your part of the world, you probably have these cards where you just beep just to ride the subway. And so he cut out that chip, he implanted it in his hand, and he was using that to get on and off public transport. And so one of the transport officers actually said um, to him, you're not riding with a valid ticket. And he argues that he is because he's still paying for it. Um, so this actually went to court. So it was a, a real life case about cyborgism and about whether you're allowed to modify your body and whether you're actually defacing um, or, or invalidating the terms of um, riding public transport and using these transport cards just by cutting it up and using it in some other form. So it, it's actually a real thing that we need to consider. Um, so transhumanisms, you could think of people who have bionic um, uh, ear implants, what do you, cochlear implants, and also... Uh, pacemakers they're also you could consider them transhumanism already it's enhancing themselves biologically or overcoming their their biological limitations using technology itself and so cases like my uh friend about whether he's allowed to put a chip in his hand to ride public transport is very important and sets a real precedent for people who have these implants for 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 medical reasons yeah, no, I think it's it's really it's a debatable topic, right? Definitely, and um, I'm really curious to see how society really takes that in when the time comes where you know we store our credit cards and security and all those information just in one chip to get anywhere, right? Um, so yeah, that's such an interesting part. Um, but yeah, so we're kind of switching like topics right now, but you know, as an entrepreneur, as a co-founder. 
what is a type of mindset that everyone should be training on constantly to just become a better leader, become a better thinker? And what is something, one of, what is one of your favorite mindset training? To always try and help other people think about how you can benefit others. So there is this research via Duke University and they say how happiness comes from how you can help other people and um, how you can improve the lives of other people. So to lead a happier life, this is something that we should definitely keep in mind. Yeah, no, definitely helping others, being altruistic. Um, I think when you do give to others, you will receive back. And that's kind of what I also live by. Um, and I try to help whoever I can with the skills I have. And I encourage everyone else to do so. Um, and especially during COVID, it is important to, you know, really, there, it's hard to find opportunities maybe. Um, but because of COVID, I think it opened more opportunities for people to virtually kind of share, you know, the skills they have and to help others benefit from that. Um, and I, you know, that, that is such an important mindset to train on, especially right now. Um, Great. So yeah. And yeah. there, was, there is uh, effective altruism groups, probably in your local city, and they have awesome communities around the world that you might want to look into. Definitely. And so, yeah, um, I have, I mean, Elise, do you have some time or are we going? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. Um, so one other question. Um, one of the audience wanted to ask was, how can we balance between environmental protection and technological innovation? Technological innovation fuels um, or can fuel environmental protection. So like with the data center project by Google, uh, that was achieved by AI. If we didn't have any progress in machine learning, then we probably wouldn't have been able to, say, achieve more efficiency in our data centers or even, like, cool it more efficiently. And also in, in terms of where I said we can actually make better choices uh, about um, which servers we use or data farms, I should say, Um the other point is technologies that are becoming increasingly more popular and emergent is uh, blockchain machine learning. These consume a lot of electricity. Um, that's a real problem. So, but how do you how do you kind of think about this as a as a positive? I think it's that. With machine learning, you can actually uh, discover better ways to do things. You can so you can get, throw it a problem, like for in the project Alpha Go by DeepMind, which is owned by Google. They literally just got the um, the AI agent to play against itself in the second Alpha Go project, where it, it didn't have any human training or hu any human intervention. So you could think of any problem you want to solve as a game. You just tell it what the rules are and what outcome you want. And it could use some type of technique to train itself. So for example, uh, reinforcement learning. So that's just, um, yeah, you, you just give it a goal essentially, and it can find the solution for you. So whether it's you want to reduce your um, energy consumption in that data center, for example, then you, you just tell it that is your problem and and it will probably find a solution way better than any human can, just like in the AlphaGo project. I think that is the way in which we can balance those two things. It's it's very hard in a capitalist world to to stop the the and, and democratic world to stop the progress of these technologies. So we need to learn how we can harness it and, and turn it around so we can use it for our benefit. Yeah. And so to close it off. Um, I just wanted to ask, how do you think our generation, the youth, can create impact on development of emerging technologies and solving the world's biggest problems? Like, what's the hope there? What do you think? I love it. I love these events and I love hearing all the speakers today. So this is a start just by educating people and just sharing your thoughts and your ideas, being really involved in a lot of um, different things. So 
that is a way in which you're making incredible impact already. Also through the Knowledge Society, which I know you're part of and a lot of people in the audience are. Um, I, I think that's really a way in which you can start. But also then looking at how you can build communities. So communities are really important because it, it's sort of like you're building a movement. And and um, so you've already seen what you can do in politics where they build up these like really massive communities and they're actually influencing um, uh, politics, I suppose. Um, or I, I should even mention the, the Reddit, the GameStop Reddit, that they're, they're actually having massive impact on the stock market. So educating people first and then building up communities, then pursuing the things that you want to do. Yeah, I mean, that's a great way to end off the talks. Um, so yeah, community is really important, guys. So I mean, work on like networking, creating, finding people. I found Elise because I was networking. And so I was able to bring her to this wonderful event. Um, and so I just also want to thank you for your wise words, Elise. And um, we will now open it up for any questions from the audience. I know Dixon said something earlier, so I'll start with that. Um, so how can we make climate change an economically incentivized problem or can it only be tackled through social demand? Social demand is probably the easiest one, but then we need to achieve price parity. So the, the choice between whether as a consumer you're gonna make um, a, a choice between green energy or not is really going to be based on price. Everyday consumers don't really care about whether where the energy is coming from, but if it was as easy as selecting that option, green or not, same price, which I do at the moment, it's um, I, I use green energy, same price for me, then I'm going to choose the green option. Um, it's there is so government should actually be stepping in because there's actually a market failure here and there's these there's these um technologies that we need to do a lot of r d on like green hydrogen carbon capture for example and these projects take a lot of capital this is where the government should be investing their money in because there's no guaranteed roi on their um uh, on their capital investment so but that's not actually happening so that's why in recent years you've seen a lot of private industry step in and fill the gaps where uh, where government should have been doing those projects. So Elon Musk is probably a really good example where he pushed through electric car adoption. He's also making uh, space travel more efficient. So it's it's not all around uh, becoming greener, but it's it's technology. It, it's projects which a lot of people wouldn't invest in because it's. It's not guaranteed it's an, um, to, to give you return and it's just hard to get off the ground. Okay, um, I'm gonna see if anyone else has questions. Um, so let's just give that a minute. And if not, um, as we wait, um, if you are new here and you don't know what COI is, COI stands for Cleaner Oceans Institute and we are basically a global youth-led organization and we're acting now to combat the environmental crisis at hand and through intersectional means. And our goal is to spread awareness and educate our audience about what is really going on, while also doing our best to provide assistance at countering the climate crisis through funding, policy-oriented work, donations, articles, and merchandising, all the way to hosting nature-oriented cleanup sessions. And so if you are an activist and are interested in joining the team, you could fill out this interest form that I'm just linking right now, and we will contact you further. But if you want to give also feedback about today's speaker event, make sure to fill out that form. Um, so yeah, we have a question real quick from Samson. Um, how to advocate for governmental action on high impact initiatives without concrete. I think he meant to say concrete or a ROI, return on investment, or take the Elon Musk um, route and do it through your own startup. Um, how do you view your own approach? Thanks for the question, Samson. Getting government to act is really hard. So unless you have significant power, um, uh, lobbying power can be incredibly difficult. I used to be part of a political party here as well. So I was an actual active member. 
it is highly factionalized and it is un- the easiest way is to find someone who is up and coming in that particular party, that uh, particular politician. And you need to just convince them that that's the way to go. Um, you can do political donations, which is you know what a lot of people do, but it's hard to match the people who ha- who have a lot of money in their pockets. So the best way I found is someone who is an advocate within the within politics, and then just just keep on pestering them for action. But they've got to be an influential, respected voice within the party. This is quite difficult, especially with the changing waves of. Uh, politics and politicians or would you take your own route and just do it privately not a lot of people have the the skin to do it so startups are hard but then when you do a startup which is in the industry which requires a lot of capital um, which doesn't have a big market and which is just it's tough like this and you've got no um you're not clear on the roi then you need a lot of skin to do this and and you actually get a lot of criticism as well so elon musk like you mentioned he gained a lot of criticism got a lot of criticism in the early days um, from naysayers about how you can't um uh you he can't do what spacex has done so what is easier and what would I do? I'd probably do it privately. You know, screw the government. They're just too slow. They're just going through bureaucracy. Yeah, I mean, that would be a really bold choice. <laughs> but, yeah. So if there are no other questions, um, if there is, um, at least you could directly, you know, reply to them. Um, ooh, my internet is unstable. Hopefully I don't. I start cutting out, but um, but yeah. So thank you so much to the speakers and the audience for making it to the end of this talk series. This was our first, but it was I would say it was actually more successful than I would I would have you know expected. And so I'm so grateful for the support from the listeners and the amazing questions that were brought up. And I thank every one of you for coming and making tonight a great experience. Um, thank you, Elise, for making time. I know it, you know, you know, the time difference and things like that, but we figured it out. out. And so um, this will not be the last of our COI talks, but hopefully we can meet everyone back when we do launch our next series of talks and maybe we'll bring Elise back and we'll also have a new guest speakers. So if you can fill out the form um, that I linked before, it would really help us in improving the talks. Um, for the future and see what you guys want in the future. And so we will all catch you soon. Um, Thank you so much for coming tonight um, or in the morning or in the afternoon, wherever you're located and have a great rest of your day. So bye. Thanks for a great event. Thanks for the awesome talks. Bye. Bye.